Okay, I want to make sure that this is, it's doing the Woer microphone. So I'm gonna... Is it that one? Or is it... Uh... Did you know that you can just come up with your own CPU instruction set and then implement it? It's totally legal and the government can't stop you. In August of 2023, just before I started my most recent job, I got really into Minecraft Redstone computers. I won't explain all the ins and outs of how cool Minecraft Redstone computers are, but my biggest takeaway from that period was how easy it was to just design a CPU. You don't even have to follow any of the big complicated standards that most CPUs use nowadays. You can just come up with your own set of assembly instructions by picking and choosing arithmetic and memory operations, assign them some unique opcodes, and then design the CPU. It's just that simple. My design, which is named Gib CPU, no relation, is an 8-bit von Neumann CPU with an 8-bit address bus. Here are a few notes about this interesting architecture. One, 8 bits means that the CPU can only take in 8 bits of instruction at a time, or one byte. Two, von Neumann architecture means that the data is stored alongside the program instructions. This is counter to Harvard architecture, which has separate buses for data and instructions. Number three, 8-bit address bus means that a single address in memory is 8 bits wide, meaning we can only fit 256 bytes worth of program instructions and data within a single program. Not only that, but each assembly instruction may contain more than one byte, which means we have less than 256 instructions in order to write a single program. I had to write a lot of testing programs in order to make sure each instruction was working correctly, but my goal from the very beginning was to write Conway's Game of Life as the proof of concept in assembly in under 256 lines of bytecode. It sounds tough, but let's give it a shot. This is the first iteration of my instruction set. I didn't want to use up all the available opcodes right away. I wasn't sure what would be needed later down the line. This gave me a great starting block with plenty of room to grow. Without getting too deep into the weeds, let me explain how each instruction is broken down. The first four bits of an instruction are the most important. They describe the function itself. AND is binary 0, ADD is binary 3, so on and so forth. The last four bits of an instruction describe which registers are being used for that operation. This is the fun thing about assembly. There's something in between a function and a variable called a register. There are four general use registers numbered 0 to 3, which can be connected to the operation registers A and B, and the result of the operation is always placed back into register B. The second to last two bits describe which register is register A, and the last two bits describe which is register B. During initial planning, I thought I could get away with only using two registers, 1 and 2. Register 0 would always read back 0, because we would always need a 0, and register 3 would be the output register. This didn't end up being the case because we needed those other registers for data. I'll explain this more later on. These instructions are broken up into two groups, arithmetic operations and memory operations. Arithmetic operations are easy to compute, just some math between values already in the registers, and only take up one byte of program memory. Memory operations are more complicated and more expensive, taking up two bytes of memory. After each memory operation is another byte, which describes the location of a variable in the program memory. I call this nextval. Now, let's see what a program looks like. In this program, we clear registers 1 and 2 by anding them with register 0, load register 1 with variable 1, load register 2 with variable 2, subtract register 2 from register 1, place the result in register 2, write register 2 down in variable 1, and jump to the end of the program if register 2 is 0. Otherwise, jump back to the top of the program. This program should only loop once before it halts. Eagle-eyed viewers might notice that there are two types of variables here. There are dollar signs and there are hashtags. Dollar signs represent data values, and hashtags represent memory locations. Initially, I planned on jumping straight into an FPGA implementation. 
so I laid out all the module schematics. Here we can see the register bank, which stores the four registers, the path setter, which connects lines A and B to the corresponding register lines, the arithmetic logic unit, which performs the arithmetic operations, the program counter, which dictates where we are in the program, the RAM, which contains the program and all its variables, and the memory control unit, which takes in data from the RAM and decides if it's command or data, then sends the corresponding signals to the rest of the CPU. Due to some timing issues, I decided to move away from hardware implementations for the time being. Instead, I wrote an emulator in C that would ideally replicate the processes that the CPU would perform. The emulator itself is the weirdest thing I've ever programmed in C because it's programmed in the style of a hardware descriptive language. Each module I've mentioned before takes the form of a function, but none of the functions take in or return values. Every variable representing a register or a data set line is a global that can be accessed anywhere. The entire program is laden with switch statements representing the many multiplexers that would be present in a hardware implementation of this CPU. When building the emulator, I was using binary programs manually written in Excel, as shown in Chapter 3. Once I was satisfied that the emulator was executing the programs correctly, I wanted to automate the process of creating these programs. So, I formalized the syntax for each assembly instruction and started work on an assembler. This additional layer would convert a text file containing assembly into a text file containing the correct binary, which would save me hours of manually writing binary in Excel. Now, how does it work? Okay, editor's note, I am cutting this segment for a few reasons. Explaining exactly how the assembler works would actually be getting way too deep into the weeds, and I am trying to keep this video as top level as possible. And I have been trying to make animations for this section in Manum, but it turns out that tables in Manum are very hard to work with, which would make this video production go way over schedule. If you are interested in checking out the assembler or any of the programs that I've mentioned, the full release GitHub of the entire project is linked in the description below. After some hard verification with a few more handwritten programs, the assembler was complete. I thought about making a compiler on top of all this, converting an even higher custom language into assembly. I decided against this when I realized just how big the generated assembly programs would be, far bigger than our 256 byte limit. Compilers are great for turning high-level language code into assembly, but they inevitably create inefficient, mass-produced assembly. I had to be as efficient as possible if I was going to get Conway's Game of Life implemented in the available memory, which meant assembly only from here on out. From here, I had to make a few more changes to the CPU and the instruction set to make Conway's Game of Life possible. We're just going to rush through them. I needed a way of programmatically changing the values in location variables. So, the load and write commands now support data variables and location variables. Registers 0 and 3 are now used as data registers. We always knew this day would come. The subtract operation has to switch its decrementer and decrementee registers. Before, if you had a number and you wanted to subtract one from it multiple times in a row, which happens a lot in Conway's Game of Life, the register holding the 1 was being overwritten with the result, meaning you had to load back in the 1 every time. By switching this so that the 1 stays behind, we can prevent a lot of load operations and save a lot of memory. Lastly, I added two more operations, load L and write L. These work the same as load and write, but instead of reading or writing into a register using a variable, which creates a costly next val, it uses an address stored in another register. Once again, this saves a ton of space in certain scenarios. We now have all the architecture in place that lets us run Conway's Game of Life. All I have to do now is write it. So, how are we going to do this? For those unaware, Conway's Game of Life is a cellular automata game. It consists of a grid, with each cell being alive or dead. After each time step, each cell on the grid changes its state according to the following rules. 1. Living cells with less than two living neighbors dies. 2. Living cells with exactly two or three living neighbors survives. 3. Living cells with more than three neighbors dies. 4. Dead cells with three live neighbors comes to life. This is a classic computer science program, and it even turns out to be Turing complete itself. 
Since I got rid of our output register, the grid will just have to be a range of data variables. For the sake of space, let's call it a 5x5 grid, which takes up 25 data variables. If each cell is numbered 0 to 24, then each neighbor for any cell n can be described as follows. n plus minus 1, n plus minus 4, n plus minus 5, and n plus minus 6. Technically, this is only true for the middle cells. Each cell around the edges will be checking up to six memory addresses out of bounds in either direction. Unfortunately, this means we need to add six buffer variables on either end of the grid, costing us 12 more bytes of memory. This does hurt me to implement, but unless I can fit wraparound functionality in less than 12 lines, this is the most memory efficient method. During the first attempt, I just started writing the program without much of a plan, resulting in an unoptimized mess that was 304 bytes long. For the second attempt, I combined two existing loops into one large loop, eliminating many variables along with it. This would save over 70 bytes of memory, bringing the size of V2 to 230 bytes. Unfortunately, this version was broken. The living cells were just disappearing. It was here that I realized just how difficult debugging and assembling would be. I have no debugger. I have to hand calculate the program in order to figure out what the register value should be at any given time. I took a break from this project for a while, coming back to it with fresh eyes. I realized that I hadn't formalized what a for loop would or should look like in assembly. I hadn't even fully broken down what the top level state machine would be for the program, or how each state would operate. I took the time to write out the top level state machine, even adding functionality for a finite number of time steps before the program halts itself. Then, I broke down state machines for each of those states, refining them when I saw inefficiencies. It was here that I realized many of the bugs that plagued V2. The reason the living cells were disappearing was due to a bug in my neighbor counting function. The neighbor count was unprotected from overflow. To combat this, I wrote a more meticulous counting method. It was costly, but necessary. Then, I identified the different types of loops that would be used for each step. I reasoned out how they would be nested and chained together, and after identifying all the loop types, I wrote out formalized examples for each. Using this new, far cleaner programming standard, I built a V3 from the ground up. Being very careful to nest each loop correctly, and paying close attention to which values were in each register at any given time. As I wrote, I found even more ways to optimize the state machines, and kept track of any redundant lines that could be removed if I went over the memory limit. When fully written, V3 stood at a hearty 229 bytes long. I tested its main execution with a known repeating pattern, the blinker. Yes! Finally some progress after so long! Now, let's move on to the most famous pattern, the glider. Ew. This might just be the outer edge making the neighbor math weird. Living cells on the edges are going to think all sorts of unconnected cells are its neighbors. I don't see a way of the glider showing its full repeating cycle without touching the edges. I think I have to modify the code to make it a 6x6 grid. That way we can see the full life cycle of the glider. And besides, I won't be satisfied with the blinker. Or worse, the block. Like, come on. <sighs> okay. What would it take to convert the grid to 6x6? Turns out, not a lot. The program is already very modular and variable based, using countdowns and jump Z for conditional jumping. All I have to do is increase the size of the grid arrays, increase the countdowns to match, update all the location variables, and change the variable containing integer 5 to 6 so that the neighbor counting will stay consistent with the new grid size. With these changes, V4 is born. It is 250 bytes long, the closest we have ever been to the limit without going over. I am prepared to have my heart broken again. Let's try this one more time with the glider. Man, what is happening? Memory, reading, and writing looks fine, and it appears to be following some kind of rule set, just not Conway's Game of Life. Now let's look at the second state. There's something very odd about this. The cell in the top left just comes out of nowhere, and the upper middle of the glider itself is alive when it should be dead. Why would that cell come to life? Wait, hold on, let me check something.
Oh no, it's bringing cells to life with three or more living neighbors. Uh, I accidentally optimized out some of the core functionality. Okay, okay, this is a quick change. It's at the very end of some state logic, which makes the fix very costly. The program is now exactly 256 bytes long. This is the limit. Here we go, for all the marbles. That was a very long and very arduous project. Overall, I estimate that this project took about 130 hours done in short bursts over the course of about nine months. That includes all the bug fixing, all of the discarded hardware design, and all of the grueling line by line binary writing and verifying that I left out of this video. So what did I learn? What could I have done better? For one, I could have just made the memory bus 16 bits wide, which would have given me 65,536 36 bytes of memory instead of the measly 256. The project has been fun and that limitation did force me to get very creative, but my god, it was so close, especially near the end. During planning, I actually thought that I couldn't because NextVal could only be as big as an opcode. I did some research after the fact, and it turns out you could have just added another NextVal, and it would have been 16 bits. So I could have trusted my tools more. Uh, the assembler near the very end was fine. It was just fine, but I kept not trusting it, which meant I kept handwriting all of the binary in the Excel sheets instead of just trusting that my tool was giving me the correct binary. And it was. In fact, it was giving me better binary than I was writing. It kept catching mistakes that I was making, but I still didn't trust it. Yeah, and I probably should have done all of the state machine planning before I started V1. I mean, who knew that I wouldn't be able to do it first try off the top of my head, all of Conway's Game of Life in assembly. You know, I thought I was him. For my next project, I'm kind of torn in between making a Gib CPU 16 and fully fleshing it out, adding a ton of different features like a stack or dedicated peripherals for output so I can maybe make a screen. It's either that or I try to implement a Gib CPU 8 on an FPGA. That way I could potentially go and have it fabricated and, you know, have an integrated chip, which is completely by my own design that would be really cool i have no idea how to do that but i can definitely go and figure that out after that who knows 32 bits make it fully risk 5 compliant make it run doom that would be really cool everything is possible anyone can do it you can do it you just gotta build